A very good evening, everybody on YouTube and on Facebook. Welcome to Live Irish Myths with me, Anthony Murphy from Mythical Ireland. I'll be with you hopefully all going well for around about the next hour. And uh, make sure wherever you're joining us from, you say hello and where you're watching from. Tonight, a little bit of an extra treat. I don't know whether you call this a treat or not. We'll see. Anyway, we'll see how this goes. I'm going to play some background music during the introduction. So I hope you're all keeping well and everybody is healthy, safe, physically distant, but not socially isolated, keeping in touch with each other. Uh, we're seeing fantastic acts of community uh, here in Drogheda and in the in the wider region. Uh, some fabulous initiatives going on. Our police force, the Garda Siakana, are delivering meals to the elderly and the homeless and the sick. It's fantastic. Uh, there's a huge amount of great things happening. Uh, amidst all the trouble and turmoil and the strife and the sadness and the anxiety. Hopefully we can distract you from all of that for the next hour. As we return to the famous story Tochmark Etain, the wooing of Etain. Last night we had part one of the story. Tonight... We're going to have parts two and three together. So hopefully uh, you'll enjoy that. Pull up a stool. Fall chikaji chok o morachu. Pull up a stool. Grab yourself a dram, glass of milk or cocoa or tea. Or if it's something stronger, Guinness, harp, <laughs> whiskey, porter, whatever you want, you know. John Main says San Francisco in the house. Good man, John. Great to see you. You're the first commenter on YouTube tonight. Eric at Rivertree. Banachty o Louisville in Kentucky. Enjoying a fabulous spring day here. Cool and sunny with birds and blooms abounding. Delighted to hear it, Erica. And lovely to have you along. And on Facebook, Jack Durkin is the first of tonight's commenters. Says, hi everyone. Hello, Jack. How are you keeping? Patricia McAteer, who's one of the locals, watching from Omeath in Cúlne, in the Cooley Peninsula, in the north of Louth. Margaret Ring is saying hello. Hi, Margaret. I think we missed you for a couple of episodes. Lovely to see you again. Yvette Tillema is saying hello. Hi, Yvette. Lovely to have you back again. And thank you for your comments on Patreon earlier. Catherine Woodruff is in central Wisconsin, warming up to 60 Fahrenheit. Don't know what that is in Celsius, uh, but if you say it's warming up, that sounds good. Nice springtime weather, hopefully. Margaret Ring says, well done, Drahada. Well, I'm sure it's happening all over the country at the moment. Federica Guy. Hi, Anthony. Hi, everybody. I hope you're well. Here in Italy, the lockdown was supposed to end tomorrow, but it will go on until the 13th of April. Well, keep safe, Federica, and I know it's been tremendously difficult there for you guys. But, Ed, uh, Someone was saying, or a lot of people were saying, don't look at it so much as being locked in the house as uh, being safe in the house, you know. Jack Durkin is in On Uiv, Condonami, Navan County Meath. Good evening, Jack. You're very welcome to episode number 22. Daniel Welch. Hello, all. Blessings to everyone. You're very welcome, Daniel. And good evening to you, Tranonawa. Mariana Dunn says, greetings from all from Virginia. Sunny here. We'll, we'll imbibe in Jemson's later. <laughs> fine, a fine dram. Uh, and uh, that's Virginia in the USA, not to be confused with Virginia County Cavan. Dana Hicks is in San Diego. Uh, hello, Dana. Very good evening to you. Uh, Yvette Tillema says would you mind letting us know which book tonight I enjoy reading along if I have it thank you so very much tonight I am reading from Ancient Irish Tales by Tom P. Cross and Clark Harris Slover this is a reprint of a, an early 20th century work uh, originally published in 1936 and available in many different sort of modern reprints so that's what I'm reading from tonight Yvette Patricia McAteer is saying hello to everyone. Margaret Mack says, hey, Anthony. Hello, Margaret. Hello from the Big Apple. Well, you're, you're very welcome in from New York, Margaret. Hope you're well and safe and healthy and all that. Maeve 
Fianna Callahan, love that middle name, Fianna. You sound like you've got the warriors on your side. Says, it's a lovely sunny day here in Portland, Oregon, with the most beautiful clouds, fantastic stuff. And it must be, what is it? Tw uh, it's 12 noon there. Wow, middle of the day. Mike Egan, Tranomawa, oh, Maine. Thank you for saying hello from Maine, Mike, and I believe it's Portland, uh, Maine, not to be confused with Portland, Oregon. Kirsten Salisbury says, hello, Tuha tribe. Hello, Tranonua, Jigwich, a Kirsten. Vicky Wallace Southall, hello, my lovely friends. Alex Casterton says, evening, Anthony, nice to see you have the music too. Sorry, a wee bit late. We did the clap for the health services. Absolutely. A hundred percent understand, Alex. No problem. As we all do too. Applaud our health services. All around the world, all those medical professionals who are doing fantastic work. Nick Eska Casterton says, Hi Anthony, hello all. Hi Nick, very good evening to you. Melissa Glassman is in Connecticut. Hello again, Melissa. You're very welcome along. On Cree Arch, Slauncha. Slauncha. Vicky Highlands. Hi Anthony, my copy of Gods and Fighting Men came today. So excited to get stuck into this brilliant stuff. And we will be getting back to Finn and the Fianna very soon, sometime in the coming days. Robert Arbuckle, boot ye Anthony. Hello everyone, a very good evening to ya. And Vicky says, Oregon sending love. And we will accept that and we'll spread it around. Alex says, evening Artua. Molly Michelle Kopeski, hello Anthony, I've been looking forward to this all day. Wonderful, and I hope we can live up to the billing. Matthew Byrne is watching, hi Matt. The most local of the viewers so far here in Rehidaha in Glanabonia. I'll switch that music off now. And that is, that piece is Khoinu Kukulan from the Riverdance album, composed by Bill Whelan and very poorly played on a low D whistle by a certain fella called M Murphy. Finbar Murphy, speaking of the devil. Finbar Murphy. Finbar O'Murhu says, greetings from Ondangan, or Dingle, as we might know it. You're very welcome along, Finbar Tofolcherot. The Curious Celt. Hi, folks. Lot of tooting on car horns and clapping tonight. Absolutely and well deserved. Ancient Erica says ancient Irish tales is one of my favorite compilations of Irish mythology. I have a first edition that I got in a friend's father's bookstore about 25 years ago. Very nice, nice uh, purchase, Erica, and a nice treasure. Martin Hughes is watching on Facebook. So hello and good evening, everyone. And as I say, this is live Irish myths. Uh, uh, one or two things to say in terms of thanks before we start. The first is that if you saw um, uh, the graphic with the beautiful woman and the horse uh, ad advertising yesterday's and today's episodes, they're slightly different, the graphics, but the same base image is represented. And that is an image by Enrique Messageur, who is on Pixabay, that's P-I-X-A-B-A-Y dot com, uh, which is a free image uh, resource. And that is a fabulous, beautiful picture. And it looks like we're going to be having trouble with YouTube again. I have no idea why that happens. And I do apologize, folks, but um, there's very little I can do about it. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm actually going to shut that down. So I'm not downloading a YouTube feed while also trying to upload one. Uh, there's there's just nothing, nothing that can be done about it at this point. I should also say, as usual, thanks to all of the Mythical Ireland patrons who helped to make this and everything else associated with Mythical Ireland happen. If you are interested in becoming a patron of Mythical Ireland, uh, head on over to patreon.com forward slash Mythical Ireland. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Mythical Ireland, where you can support Mythical Ireland for as little as $1 a month. But there are higher tiers and there are different levels of reward because, yes, you do get rewards for your support. Heard a shot on YouTube says... This is so helpful on this lockdown. Thank you so much, Anthony. Well, I'm glad that it's helping. It's helping me, and I'm glad to hear it's helping you all too. You can't beat a little bit of storytelling uh, to put the mind at ease uh, and to take our worries away and to bring us into other worlds. So there's a brief introduction, and uh, just in case, if you're interested in following along and you have it, Ancient Irish Tales uh, Har uh, Clark uh, Cross and Slover I was going to say Clark and Slover 
It's Cro- Tom Cross and, Her- and Clark Slover. Um, originally published in 1936. The wooing of Etain in Irish, Tuchmark Etain, composed in its oldest form as early as the 8th century, is one of the most charming pieces of romantic fiction preserved from the vernacular literature of medieval Europe. Though, unfortunately, the story exists only in a series of disconnected and mutilated fragments, enough remains to illustrate admirably the highly developed style and delicate treatment of sentiment which characterise ancient Irish literature. And this is very interesting, because last night, this was published 1936, and last night we read that it was only in 1937 that the complete a text of the wooing of Etain finally appeared in print because uh, the complete version of the story was discovered lying innocently among, among a part of the yellow book of Lecan housed in Cheltenham. So um, uh, part one of the tale is actually skipped over in this translation, uh, but the whole thing was available the year after this book was first published. In her earlier career, not recounted here, and that's the episode we did yesterday, Etain is associated not only with Mir, but also with Angus Og, a well-known supernatural personage who figures in the mythological cycle. According to the annals, her mortal husband, Yuchi Aram, became High King of Ireland about 134 BC. The wooing of Etain is connected with the destruction of Dardarga's hostel, that's uh, Togol Brunya Dardarga, which we are going to treat in two episodes shortly coming, probably in the next week. By the fact it's too long to read in one single episode. By the fact that Etain's grandson, King Conor Amor, meets his death as a result of Yuchi's having destroyed the fairy mound of Brile, whither Etain had been abducted by Mir. Jack Durkin says, Hi, ma'am. It's lovely that people are meeting family and friends on here. I hope you're all enjoying the stories. So here we go. Here is the second part of The Wooing of Etain, Tuchmark Etain. There was an admirable, noble king in the high kingship over Ireland, namely Yuchi Aran. The first year after he ascended the throne, a proclamation was made throughout Ireland that the Feast of Tara was to be celebrated and that all the men of Ireland should attend it, that their taxes and their levies might be known. Eva Anderson says, Finally, I am listening live, not the day after, listening from Gothenburg in Sweden. Hello, Eva, a falche, and uh, pull up a, a, a pew, pull up a chair, grab a dram and sit by the fire and have a, a nice evening. Kerem Gogus is watching. Hello, Kerem, lovely to see you again. Uh, Cree Arch is saying Falche Eva. And the one answer made by all the men of Ireland to Yuchi summons was that they would not attend the Feast of Tara during such time, whether it be long or short, as the King of Ireland was, was without a wife that was suitable for him. There, for there was not a noble of the men of Ireland who was without a wife suitable for him. And there was not a king without a queen, And there would not come a man without his wife to the Feast of Tara, nor would there come a woman without a husband. So that was telling him. Thereupon Yuki sent out from, from him his horsemen and his entertainers and his spies and his messengers of the border throughout Ireland. And they searched all Ireland for a woman who should be suitable for the king in respect to form and grace and countenance and birth. And one wonders what the word was that was translated to entertainers. It was it in fact the Druids who we addressed in an episode uh, very recently. EDT, is it T or Tia? EDT says, how are you Anthony? Lovely to catch another live. I'm in great form ED. Thank you very much. Tofal to Rowett. It's lovely to see you. You're very welcome along to episode 22. Charlotte Epifanio says hello from California. Another one from California this evening. We have two or three viewers in California. You're all very, very welcome. And besides all this, there was one more condition regarding her. The king would never take a wife who had been given to anyone else before him. And the king's officers sought all Ireland, both south and north, and they found at Inverkichmani a woman suitable for him, that is, 
Etain, the daughter of Etar, who was king of Ekra. Then his messengers returned to Yochi and gave him a description of the maiden in regard to form and grace and countenance. And Yochi set forth to take the maiden, and the way that he went was across the fair green of Brile. And there he saw a maiden upon the bank of a spring. She held in her hand a comb of silver decorated with gold. Beside her, as for washing, was a basin of silver whereon were chased four golden birds, and there were little bright gems of carbuncle set in the rim of the basin. A cloak, pure purple, hanging in folds about her, and beneath it a mantle with silver borders and a brooch of gold in the garment over her bosom, a tunic with a long hood about her, and as for it, smooth and glossy. It was made of greenish silk beneath red embroidery of gold, and marvellous bow pins of silver and gold upon her breasts in the tunic, so that the redness of the gold against the sun in the greeny silk was clearly visible to the men. Two tresses of golden hair upon her head, and a plaiting of four strands in each tress, and a ball of gold upon the end of each plait. Tracy says, hi, Anthony, and hi, and everyone. Good evening, Tracy. Aaron Durrett, hi, friends, in late, but here. Better late than never. Pull up a stool and uh, grab yourself a dram and uh, let's enjoy a little bit of storytelling and uh, a bit of conch. August, perhaps a bit of crack uh, fame uh, also. Um, yeah, I think, I think that unfortunately, the, the YouTube feed has gone down again. I have no idea what the story is there hopefully i think the last time it went down people were still able to hear although they weren't able to see that's no loss so long as you can hear that's all that matters and the maiden was there loosening her hair to wash it and her two arms out through the armholes of her smock as white as the snow of one night was each of her two arms and as red as the foxglove of the mountain was each of her two cheeks as blue as the hyacinth was each of her two eyes delicately red her lips very high soft and white her two shoulders tender smooth and white were her two wrists her fingers long and very white her nails pink and beautiful as white as snow or as the foam of the wave was her side slender long and as soft as silk soft smooth and white were her thighs round and small firm and white were her two knees as straight as a rule were her two ankles slim and foam white were her two feet fair and very beautiful were her two eyes her eyebrows blackish blue like the shell of a beetle it was she the maiden who was the fairest and the most beautiful that the eyes of men had ever seen and it seemed probable to the king that his companions and his companions that she was out of a fairy mount and that's likely translated from she she was a woman of the she tanya noble says good evening to you all from illinois you're very welcome along tanya this is the maiden concerning whom is spoken the proverb quote, every lovely form must be tested by etain every beauty by the standard of etain unquote a desire for her seized the king immediately and he sent a man to his company of his company to hold her before him then yuki approached the maiden and questioned her whence art thou o maiden said the king and whence hast thou come the uh, the, uh, the the english here is a little bit more archaic in this translation not hard to answer replied the maiden etain the daughter of the king of ekra out of the fairy mounds i am called shall i have an hour of dalliance with thee said yuki it is for that that i come hither under thy protection said she i have been here for twenty years since i was born in the fairy mound and the men of the fairy mound both kings and nobles have been wooing me and naught was got by any of them from me because i have loved thee and given love and affection to thee since i was a little child and since i was capable of speaking it's a little bit in that regard, a tiny bit reminds me of the story of Deirdre, who was actually kept captive by, um, wasn't it, King Crohor, um, as a child, because he wanted to marry her when she grew up. But we won't spoil that story, because we will be telling the story of Deirdre and the sons of Ishnak. It was for the noble tales about thee, and for thy splendour, that I have loved thee. And although I have never seen thee before, I recognise thee at once by thy description. It is thou, I know, to whom I have attained, said she. 
That is by no means the invitation of a bad friend, replied Yucky. Thou shalt be welcomed by me, and all other women shall be left for thy sake, and with thee alone will I live as long as it is pleasing to thee. Interestingly, by the way, a lot of kings in the medieval literature have the name Yucky. Uh, like we thought we saw another name for Dagda was uh, Yuchi Olahar. Give me my fitting bride price, said the maiden, and thereafter let my desire be fulfilled. That shall be to thee, said the king. The value of seven bond slaves was given to her for a bride price, and after that he took with her with him to Tara, and a truly hearty welcome was given to her. Now there were three brothers of one blood who were the sons of Finn, Yuchi Aram and Yuchi Fedlach and Eilil Ang Anglanach, or Eilil of the One Stain. Uh, that's obviously Anglanach, because the only stain that was upon him was that he loved his brother's wife. At that time came the men of Aaron to hold the Feast of Tara, and they were there fourteen days before Samhain, Halloween, and fourteen days after Samhain. It was at the Feast of Tara that Eilil Anglonach fell in love with Etain, the daughter of Etar. Eilil gazed at the woman as long as he was at the Feast of Tara. Then Eilil's wife, the daughter of Luchta Redhand from the borders of Leinster, said to her husband, Eilil, said she, why dost thou keep gazing far off from thee? For such long looking is a sign of love. Thereupon Eilil became ashamed and blamed himself for that thing, and he did not look at Etain after that. Aaron wants to know if Yuchi has a meaning in Irish. It's an interesting question. I'm sure it does, but I can't remember offhand, so I will look it up momentarily. Judy McQueen says, Hello from Oregon. Another viewer from the west coast of the States. As usual, very, very strongly represented. You're very welcome along, uh, Judy. Is it from horse? On Creoch says, Yucky is from horse. Uh, yes, Ech Echria, which is Etain's uh, second name, surname, uh, means horse rider. Let me just uh, very quickly. Yucky, yucky, yucky. Mm. Yeah, there are a lot of yuckies. Pre Christian sun god of the ancient Irish, horseman of the heavens. Yeah, there you go. God of lightning, and his sword is a lightning bolt. horseman of the heavens there you go fantastic stuff no can i find where i was <laughs> oh yeah i can after the feast of tara the men of ireland separated from one another and then it was that the pains of jealousy and great envy filled eilil and a, a heavy illness came upon him and we remember uh, don't we indeed from a recent story about how love sickness can come upon a man and that man in in question was angus in ashlinga angusso the dream vision of angus og which was episode nine uh missing questions here i think story sounds a lot like christian a bit like tristan and isolde says Aaron. yes indeed Tracy O'Connor says, reminds me of Macha. Can we have a telling of the story of Macha too, Anthony, if you haven't already? Well, I haven't already, uh, Tracy, but I think it's on the list. I'll just check. I mean, Macha would be one of the, to be a strong association there with Morrigan, but we only did Morrigan in terms of the Cop Maitura. So I think we'll be okay. Just check in here for Macha. If it's not on the list, it would be put. Yeah, Macha. And horses in Celtic mythology was suggested by Sheila Weekly Murphy. Um, so we'll put you in there as suggesting Macha. Yeah, so that's one we can do hopefully sooner rather than later. Thanks for the suggestion. Uh, Margaret Tilston, been watching you on YouTube. Brilliant, thank you. Thanks, Margaret. Hope you're enjoying it. Gerard Irla, according to Margaret Ring, rides a horse every seven years in Loch Gur. He rises out of the lake. Well, Margaret, I'm not sure if you were watching the episode about the high man and Garrett's fort near RD in County Louth here, uh, where Garrett is uh, waiting with his enchanted army uh, to be roused for some great battle. 
After the Feast of Tara, the men of Ireland separated from one another, and then it was that the pains of jealousy and great envy filled Eilil, and a heavy illness came upon him. As a result, he was carried to Dun Fremen in Tethba, the favourite stronghold of his brother, the king. Eilil remained there to the end of a year in long sickness and in long pining, but he did not confess the cause of his sickness to anyone. And thither came Yuki to inquire after Eilil. He put his hand upon Eilil's breast, whereupon Eilil heaved a sigh. This is some sort of a, 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 a doctor's uh, examination going on here. Uh, Callum Barrett says, sorry I'm late. Just came off a call with my girlfriend. Well, Callum, you know, love comes first. Absolutely. I, live Irish myths come second to that sort of call. I completely understand. <laughs> Machat represented in Song of the Sea. Uh, was Song of the Sea, is that the... Uh, are we talking about the myth or are we talking about the movie, the animated movie, which is a beautiful film? Maka was said to turn into a war horse too. Yes, well, we will get to that. The time when so many stories are set is Samhain, according to Federica Guy. Yes, there are some scholars who think that's retrospective, that when it came to writing them down, they were all based around Samhain. I'm not so sure about that, to be honest, you know. Uh, Tracy says maybe she could join you here too she who maybe who could join sorry I missed I'm I'm totally distracted now Margaret Ring Mythflix yeah uh, do you think we could um, uh, trademark or copyright Mythflix <laughs> he put his hand upon Eileen's breast whereupon Eileen heaved a sigh now said Yucky the sickness in which thou art does not appear to be serious how is everything with thee and the typical doctor patient relationship the first thing you need to do is chat to your patient and find out how they are by my word replied Eilil not easier is it with me but worse in all respects every day and every night what ails thee asked Yochi by my true word said Eilil I do not know Let there be brought to me someone who shall make known the cause of this illness, said Yochi. Then was brought to them Fachna, the physician of Yochi, and Fachna put his hand upon Alil's breast, and Alil sighed. Sorry, Anthony, replying to Callum Ree's girlfriend. Yes, indeed. Uh, Tracy makes an excellent suggestion. Callum, bring the girlfriend along with you for the story. Aaron says, Anthony Murphy, copyright 2020, Mythflix. <laughs> yes, to Mythflix. <laughs> uh, Margaret, you're a genius. Then, uh, yes, fuck now. No, this is totally distracting. I, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm getting I'm getting thrown off the uh, the scent of the, the story here. Now, said Fachna, the matter is not serious. There is nothing the matter with thee but one of two things. That is, either the pains of jealousy or love, which thou hast given, and thou hast found no help till now. Thereupon Elil was shamed. He did not confess the cause of his illness to the physician, and the physician went from him. Now, as regards Yochi, he went out to make his royal circuit throughout Ireland, and he left Etain in the stronghold of Fremen. And he said to her, Deal gently with Elil as long as he is alive. And, he sh and should he die, said he, Have his grave of sod dug, and let his pillar stone be raised, and let his name be written on it, again sorry in o in Oam not again in Oam the king then departed on his royal circuit of Ireland leaving Eileel there in Dunfremen in expectation of death and dissolution for the space of that year into the house in which Eileel was Etain used to go each day to consult with and minister to him one day she asked him what is the matter with thee Thy sickness is indeed great, and if we knew anything that would satisfy thee, thou shouldst get it from us. It was thus that she spoke, and she sang a little lay, and Eilil answered her. As the result of their dialogue, Etain finally understands that her brother-in-law is suffering from love of herself. Etain continued to come every day to Eilil to bathe him and to divide his food for him, and she helped him greatly, for she was sad at seeing him perish because of her. One day she said to Eilil, Come tomorrow at daybreak to tryst with me in the house that stands outside the stronghold, and there shalt thou have granted thy request and thy desire. On that night Eilil lay without sleep until the coming of the morning, and when the time had come that was appointed for his tryst, 
his sleep lay heavily upon him, so that till the hour of his rising he lay deep in his sleep. Oh, oh, oh silly boy. And Etain went to the tryst, nor had she long to wait ere she saw a man coming towards her in the likeness of Eilil, weary and feeble, but she knew that he was not Eilil, and continued there waiting for Eilil. And the lady came back from her tryst, and Eilil woke, and thought that he would rather die than live, and he was in great sadness and grief. And the lady came to speak with him, and when he told her what had befallen him, come, said she, to the same place to meet with me tomorrow. And upon the morrow it was the same as upon the first day. Each day came the same man to her tryst. And she came again upon the last day that was appointed for the tryst, and the same man met her. "'Tis not with thee that I trysted," said she. "'Why dost thou come to meet me, and for with whom I would have met here, "'neither from desire of his love, nor for fear of harm from him, "'had I appointed to meet him, but only to heal him, "'and to cure him from the sickness which had come upon him for his love of me. "'It were more fitting for thee to come to tryst with me,' said the man." For when thou wast Etain, daughter of the king of Echra, and when thou wast the daughter of Eilil, I myself was thy first husband. Why, said she, what is thy name at all, if it were to be, de to be demanded of thee? It is not hard to answer thee. Come on, folks, you tell me, what's his name? It is not hard to answer thee, he said, before identifying himself. Mir of Brile is my name. And what made thee to part from me, if we were as, as thou sayest, said Etain. Easy again is the answer, said Mir. It was the sorcery of Fulmnach and the spells of Bressel Etherlau that put us apart. And Mir said to Etain, Wilt thou come with me? Nay, answered Etain, I will not exchange the king of all Ireland for thee for a man whose kindred and whose lineage is unknown. It was I myself indeed, said Mir, who filled all the mind of Eilil with love for thee. It was I also who prevented his coming to the tryst with thee, and allowed him not to spoil thy honour. After all this, the lady went back to her house, and she came to speech with Eilil, and she greeted him. It hath happened well for us both, said Eilil, that the man met thee there, for I am cured forever from my illness. Thou also art unhurt in thine honour, and may a blessing rest upon thee. Thanks be to our God, said Etain, that both of us do indeed deem that all this hath chanced so well. And after that, Yuki came back again, sorry, came back from his royal progress, and he asked at once for his brother. And the tale was told to him from the beginning to the end. And the king was grateful to Etain, in that she had been gracious to Eilil. And what hath, what hath been related in this tale, said Yochi, is well pleasing to ourselves. Now I think that's where part two ends. It is, and part three will shortly begin. Just bear with me one moment till I check the... Yeah, unfortunately I think the YouTubers have lost us completely. Um, uh, I'm not going to do what I did in previous episodes and get completely distracted uh, by that. Um, unfortunately, I can't do anything about that right now. And on to part three. But before we do that, let us just recap that we haven't missed anything. Oh, we have Graham Connolly. Sorry, I double tapped the screen. Really enjoying these episodes, Anthony. I only started listening yesterday and I'm already on episode five. Looking forward to the rest of the titles. Fair play to you, sir. Well, that's lovely to hear, Graham. Glad you're enjoying them. You're, you're very welcome to live Irish Schmitz it's lovely to see you and indeed you have the great joy now of catching up on what another 16 hours well it's more than they're generally run over an hour so uh, probably about 17 hours of listening in addition to this live one so it's lovely to see you Graham thanks for saying hello Tracy says I think we are all lovesick in some form a longing for the love that is at the heart of the she one we humans have long forgotten and yearn to reclaim a love that was is within us all when we remember how to find it uh, very very true and very interesting in that regard um, is a uh, an image uh, which I probably can't find immediately but I'll share with you at some stage 
I took an image from the air a couple of solstices ago. Oh, here we go. I wonder, can I download that? Um, or share? Oh, I can share the link with you. Uh, Newgrange, the monument, is heart-shaped. <laughs> it's actually heart-shaped. And so I, 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 I sent out this solstice card happy winter solstice with love from newgrange the heart of the boyne valley i hope you all enjoy that hang on now till i just paste that in and again apologies to the youtube fee, fee uh, watchers uh, i i i i just have no idea i tested the speed before this episode i had a speed of 45 upload and 30 sorry 45 download and 35 upload i mean these are great speeds there's absolutely no reason why that should be getting disconnected um so I've no idea what the story is there and I apologize. I will upload a, a clean version, either the recorded one from the YouTube software or from Facebook uh, onto YouTube later. So uh, nobody will, will, will miss it, as it were. There are some people who watch on YouTube who don't have Facebook accounts. So I've just shared the link there to that picture, uh, the heart and the love. Uh, if only we, we could find it, says you. Okay. Uh, on Creoch, I'm not sure uh, what, what you mean by mere judge. OK, that's what mere means related to M-I-D-E-R-E-D. -E -E I'm not sure. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Is that another name from mythology? I'm not uh, fam immediately familiar with it. I, I do apologize uh, for that. And now on to part three uh, where there are no YouTube comments because uh, actually, do you know what? I could stop streaming and start streaming again, couldn't I? OK, I've started that again, um, just keeping the fingers crossed uh, that uh, that might clear it out and, and, and help. Um, let me just have a check on that. I, I do apologise uh, for that. And now on to part three. Uh, where there are no YouTube comments because. Uh, OK, so it does seem to be still there, but it seems to be a much reduced um, interaction on the on the youtube version so i'm sorry about that again anyway we shall get on presently with uh part three of the story the uh yeah the uh the technical issues we can't do much about so i i do i do sorry i do apologize Oh, so there are comments now that I see. David Ebel says, glad to make it to a live show. Anthony, what do you make of the fur bullock as hunter-gatherer people as the, and the Tua de Dana being a herder agricultural group? Yeah, it's very interesting uh, um, because you see cows and cattle entering the mythology, especially in relation to the de Danans. Perhaps that's something we could cover uh, as an episode in the future. Uh, let me just take note of that. Uh, sorry, We'll, we'll get on to part three momentarily. Fur bullock equals hunter gatherers to a day equals herders farmers. And that suggestion is from David Ebel. E-B-E-L. Is it David Ebel or David Ebel? I, I apologize if I have that wrong, David, but thanks, thanks a million for the suggestion. John Main says looking good now. Yeah, with apologies to the YouTubers. I have no idea what causes this problem. Uh, Liam wants to know what's my view on the rebuild of Newgrange. Uh, do you think it's accurate? Liam, do you know what? Uh, even, it's not really mythological. That's more archaeological. I mean, I would be happy to do an episode on that. Actually, I do have opinions about it. Uh, and I certainly uh, I have strong opinions about a certain individual who's, uh, who's making false claims about it. But... Um, if this uh, series continues uh, for a long duration, which hopefully it will, I don't mean because COVID-19 goes on for long. I don't mean that at all. I mean that we can continue this long after the COVID-19 situation has been recovered from. Uh, we may be able to broaden out to topics of archaeology and astronomy, etc., etc. I do have very strong opinions about it, Liam, but uh, not for tonight. Um so I'll, I'll put that down as an episode. And I see some of you are making contact privately. Lovely to see you all making connections. So part three, here we go. 
Now upon another time it chanced that Yuchi Aram, the king of Tara, arose upon a certain fair day in the time of summer, and he ascended the high ground of Tara to behold the plain of Breg. Beautiful was the colour of that plain, and there was upon it excellent blossom, glaring with all hues that are known. And as the aforesaid Yuchi looked about and around him, he saw a young strange warrior upon the high ground at his side. The tunic that the warrior wore was purple in colour, his hair was of golden yellow and of such length that it reached to the edge of his shoulders. The eyes of the young warrior were lustrous and grey, in the one hand he held a five-pointed spear, in the other a shield with a white central boss, boss and with gems of gold upon it, and Yucky held his peace for he knew that none such had been in Tara on the night before, and the gate that led into the enclosure had not at that hour been thrown open. The warrior came and placed himself under the protection of Yuchi, and welcome do I give, said Yuchi, to the hero who is yet unknown. And here again we have reflections of the story of the, the coming of Lu which I think we dealt with in episode two, uh, which is part of the story Kot Moitura, the second battle of Moitura, which we dealt with in a recent episode. And that is that Lu came to the gate of Tara offering his services. Thy reception is such as I expected when I came, said the warrior. We know thee not, answered Yuchi. Yet thee in truth I know well, he replied. What is the name by which thou art called, said Yuchi. My name is not known to renown, said the warrior. I am Mir of Brile. And for what purpose art thou come, said Yuki? I am come that I may play a game of chess with thee, answered Mir. And a chess is probably a translation from that word fichil, which is a, an Irish version of chess or perhaps a precursor to chess. Truly, said Yuki, I Myself, am skillful at chess play. And again, this is, uh, I think we, we, we had a summary of this last night, didn't we? But uh, again, the chess play uh, goes back to Lou uh, when he was eventually invited into Tara. Uh, he, he had to do, he had to perform certain feats, but he, he beat the king at Fickel in several games. Julianne Osborne is watching. Hello, Julianne. And Liam Smith, looking forward to it. Thanks. You're very welcome. Um, Don is asking, do we have any pygmy flint small cup marks on stones? Um, I, I, I'm not really sure. Uh, oh, that's a whole other area. Um, and I think that we would have to get in some expertise on megalithic art to answer that one. Uh, because I can't answer it. And I don't even know what pygmy flint is. But I know that we do have cup holes. Or cup marks. On many stones. Uh, both in the megalithic sphere. On some of the megalithic monuments. And of course on some of the. Uh, what, what you might call the open ear. Uh, rock art uh, carvings. Uh, but beyond that I can't really say. I'm afraid. Jacqueline Kennedy says sorry I'm late. But hello and lots of love guys. We've just started part three Jacqueline of uh, Tukmark Eitain and so hopefully you can catch up on part two on the video. Margaret says chess is strategy. The Tuha introduced it. Yes, strategy indeed. Let us test that skill, said Mir. This is when Yuki had said that he was a good chess player. Nay, said Yuki, the queen is even now in her sleep and hers is the apartment in which the chessboard lies. <laughs> he wasn't going to disturb the queen to get the chessboard. I have here with me, said Mir, a chessboard which is not inferior to thine. It was even as he said, for that chessboard was silver. There we go. Somebody said silver. We've, we're getting lots of silver tonight. And the men to play with were gold. And upon that board were costly stones, casting their light on every side. And the bag that held the men was, was of woven chains of brass. Mir then set out the chessboard, and he called upon Yuki to play. I will not play, said Yuki, unless we play for a stake. And he I don't think he was talking about uh, ribeye or T-bone. <laughs> S-T-A-K-E. Uh, never mind. Poor joke on my part. I apologise. It won't happen again. What stake shall we have upon the game then, said Mir? 
It is indifferent to me, said Yucky. Then, said Mir, if thou dost obtain the four, four feet of my stake, I will bestow on thee fifty steeds of a dark grey, their heads of a blood-red colour but dappled, their ears pricked high, and their chests broad, their nostrils wide, and their hoofs slender. Great is their strength, and they are keen like a whetted edge. Eager are they, high-standing and spirited, yet easily stopped in their course. Can you guess? Can you preempt? If you haven't heard this story, can you preempt uh, what Mir's uh, demand of the king is if the king loses? Can you not see that plot line a million miles off? Several games were played between Yuki and Mir. And since Mir did not put forth his whole strength, the victory on all occasions rested with Yuki. But instead of the gifts which Mir had offered, Yuki demanded that Mir and his folk should perform for him services which should be of benefit to his realm, that he should clear away the rocks and stones from the plains of Meath, should remove the rushes which made the land barren around his favourite fort of Tethba, should cut down the forest of Bregg, and finally should build a causeway across across the moor or bog of Lauroch that men might pass freely across it. By the way, you might be interested to hear that that same pathway across the bog is believed to be a mention in mythology of a real roadway which has been unearthed in recent uh, decades as the Corley uh, Bog Road, part of which is preserved uh, in a visitor centre open to the public. Well, not at the moment, obviously, during the current restrictions. All these things Mir agreed to, and Yuki sent his steward to see how and when it came to the time after sunset, the steward looked and he saw that Mir and his fairy host, together with fairy oxen, were labouring at the causeway over the bog, and thereupon much of earth and of gravel and of stones was poured into it. Now it had, before that time, always been the custom of the men of Ireland to harness their oxen with a strap over their foreheads, so that the pull might be against the foreheads of the oxen, and this custom lasted up to that very night, when it was seen that the fairy folk had placed the yoke upon the shoulders of the oxen, so that the pull might be there, and in this way were the yokes of the oxen afterwards placed by Yucky. Interesting, suggesting here that, uh, in a way, that the two of the Danon, the she folk, were the ones who showed how to properly uh, yoke the oxen. And thence comes the name, com- comes the name by which he is known, even Yucky Aram, or Yucky the Ploughman. For he was the first of all the men of Ireland to put the yokes on the necks of the oxen and thus it became the custom for all the land of Ireland. And this is the song that the host of the fairies sang as they laboured at the making of the road. Thrust it in hand, force it in hand, noble this night the troop of oxen, hard is the task that is asked, and who from the bridging of Lauroch shall receive gain or harm. I uh, just want to catch up. I see some comments flying up the screen there. Uh, Aaron says we love puns, Anthony. Brilliant. Ocris Oramanish. <laughs> Tracy says speak for yourself, Aaron. Some people don't have any sense of humour. <laughs> part two of three is slightly more romantic than part one. The translation, anyway, although the early modern English phrasing thee, thou, etc. feels silly. Yes, it does, Maeve. I agree with you. Uh, Erica Rivertree says an episode on wells in myths such as Necht and Segish, Conla, etc. Oh, fantastic. Yes, what a brilliant suggestion, Erica. Uh, and that is something I could talk about for quite a while. Brilliant suggestion, yes. Okay. Maeve, but I'm waiting to hear anything of Etain's feelings about all of this. Exactly, Maeve. This seems to be written uh, from a distinctly male perspective. Maybe Anthony should rewrite the story in a modern language. Yes, as I did with uh, Ashlinga Ingeso, which is on my website, uh, updated from that sort of archaic English to a, a modern retelling. I'd be glad to do that. There's several layers of interpretation and translation over time, uh, undoubtedly. Aaron says, ah, the first farmers with the first yokes on the oxen, eh? Yeah, absolutely. 
now just to catch up on YouTube. My apologies to the YouTubers for the interruptions. Hi, Dad. It's Finn. FM1998. Hello, Finn. <laughs> Hiya, buddy. My youngest is watching. Uh, he has an illustrious name. He also happens to be fair haired as well. Um, not sure where he's watching. Oh, there he is. He's out, he's out there watching. It'll take a few seconds for the, the uh, transmission to actually get to him. Hopefully he hasn't become distracted by something else. Um, a Royal Tara Hill, Hill of Tara Ranger, whose name is Paul. It's expensive, Newgrange. Do you think they are they would have needed work done? Yes, a very interesting point. I did say that in Altrum Chiagawather, which is one of the stories about Newgrange, they talk about rushes uh, being placed on it for Mananon's visit, which is interesting. And also don't forget that we had uh, uh, yesterday in the first part of uh, Tuchmar Gitain, we had a suggestion that wildflowers and herbs were planted around the sunny bower that Angus was protecting Etain in from Fulmnock. And of course, that sunny bower is undoubtedly Newgrange. So, yeah, probably they did have to maintain it. Uh, and I think that the collapse of Newgrange wasn't, uh, as the archaeologists maintained, uh, uh, due to some uh, uh, earth tremor or, or hard frosts. I think it was more likely a purpose, a purposeful uh, uh, sealing in, as it were. Not in all the world could a road have been found that should be better than the road that they made, had it not been that the fairy folk were observed as they worked upon it. I have a feeling he's out there at the kitchen table and he's watching his phone. And I have a feeling he's actually. Did you did you see that? I said hello. Oh, he, he did. I thought maybe he'd become distracted by other videos. That happens. Ele Eleven year olds. They, their attention span is perhaps not as good as some of you guys. On Grianon says on Creoch. Yes, a sunny bower. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the. The words were translated from i will go back to it actually i have uh oh we're getting distracted again i know we are but look these distractions are always good aren't they i have in my possession the irish from laura mahira the book of the dun cow which is the earliest surviving ma irish manuscript in which an incomplete version of tuchmark etain can be found and there you see the hopefully See for the YouTubers and for the Facebookers is back to front Tuchmark Etain. Uh, and so you can see there, look, there's some of the Irish there. Fomnach be ba ben mir simal ishbri co milib imbri le malaharlan ro lushkeha la manadon. So you can see there the Irish and you can guess what some of the English. Uh, words are but as i said it is incomplete and i think that there is reference in this uh to that uh, uh trackway the corley trackway or the the causeway that had to be built across the bog rabbit holes are good when we get to learn from them yeah i like rabbit holes the problem is that i uh, i tend to be, i'm very i'm very tangential in my thinking uh, and i find it very hard to stay on one track um uh, and in my research i i tend to get pulled in different directions which is all very well when you're on your own researching for something but when you're telling a story live and suddenly you go off on a tangent people are sitting there going anthony will you get back to the story i'm sure uh but there are lots and lots and lots and lots of rabbit holes that we can disappear down uh through uh, in the duration of li live irish myths and in future episodes Not in all the world could a road have been found that should be better than the road that they made, had it not been that the fairy folk were observed as they worked upon it. But for that cause, a breach has been made in that causeway. And, and, and just bear in mind that when, when the English translation says fairy folk, uh, we, are talking, we are talking about the Tua de Danon, uh, the folk of the Shi. We're not talking about the fairies as in the, you know, the late Victorian uh, idea of uh, diminutive um, uh, 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 beings and the steward of yochi thereafter came to him and he, he described to him that great labouring band that had come before his eyes and he said that there was not over the chariot pole of life a power that could withstand its might i wonder what the chariot pole of life is 
And as they spoke, I- I'm just thinking about um, an Axis Monday, you know, something like the Bill of the Sacred Tree. I don't know. And as they spoke thus with each other, they saw Mir standing before them. High was he girt, and ill-favoured was the face that he showed. And Yuki arose, and he gave welcome to him. Thy welcome is such as I expected when I came, said Mir. Cruel and senseless hast thou been in thy treatment of me, and much of hardship and suffering hast thou given me. Yes, I think uh, uh, whoever suggested it was a Tracy or someone. Uh, I think this will have to be, I think I'll have to get my pen to work on this. This is a project that I can get working on uh, in my spare time. Uh, is I may rewrite this uh, into, into more modern English. All things that seemed good in thy sight have I got for thee, but now anger against thee hath filled my mind. I return not anger for anger, answered Yuki. What thou wishest shall be done. Let it be as thou wishest, said Mir. Shall we play at the chess, said he. What stake shall we meet, shall we set upon the game, said Yuki. Even such stake as the winner of it shall demand, said Mir, and in that very place Yuki was defeated, and he forfeited his stake. My stake is forfeited to thee, said Yuki. Had I wished it, it had been forfeited a long ago, said Mir. What is it that thou desirest me to grant, said Yuki? That I may hold Etain in my arms and obtain a kiss from her, answered Mir. You saw that comment, didn't you? Yuki was silent for a while, and then he said, One month from this day thou shalt come, and that very thing that thou hast asked for shall be given to thee. Now for a year before that, Mir first came to Yuki for the chess play. Had he been at the wooing of Etain, and he ob- obtained her not, and the name which he gave to Etain was Bayfind, or Fair-Haired Woman, so that it was said, Wilt thou come with me, Fair-Haired Woman? As has before been recited. And it was at that time that Etain said, If thou obtainest me from him who is the master of my house, I will go. But if thou art not able to obtain me from him, then I will not go. And whereupon Mir came to Yochi, and allowed him at the first to win the victory over him, in order that Yuki should stand in his debt. And therefore it was that he paid the great stakes to which he had agreed, and therefore also was it that he demanded of him that he should play that game in ignorance of what was staked. And when Mir and his folk were paying those agreed-on stakes, which were paid upon that night, to wit the making of the road and the clearing of the stones from Meath, the rushes from around Tethba and the forest that is over Breg. It was thus that he spake, as it is written in the book of Drumshnechta. Pile on the soil, thrust on the soil, red are to labour. Heavy the troops that obey my words, heavy they seem, and yet men are they. Strongly as piles are the tree trunks placed, Red are the wattles abound above them. Tied are your hands and your glances slant. One woman's winning this toil may yield. Oxen ye are, but revenge shall see. Men who are white shall be your servants. Rushes from Tethba are cleared. Grief is the price that the man shall pay. Stones have been cleared from the rough meath ground. Whose gain? Sorry, Whose shall the gain or the harm be? Now Mir appointed a day at the end of the month when he was to meet Yuki, and Yuki called the armies of the heroes of Ireland together, so that they came to Tara, and all the best of the champions of Ireland, ring within ring, were about Tara, and they were in the midst of Tara itself, and they guarded it, both without and within, and the king and the queen were in the midst of the palace, and the outer court thereof was shut and locked, for they knew that the great night of men would come upon them. And upon the appointed night, Etain was dispensing the banquet to the kings, for it was her duty to pour out the wine, when, in the midst of their talk, they saw Mir standing before them in the centre of the palace. He was always fair, yet fairer than he ever was seemed Mir to be upon that night. And he brought to amazement all the hosts 
on which he gazed, and all thereupon were silent, and the king gave a welcome to him. Thy reception is such as I expected when I came, said Mir. Let that now be given to me which has been promised. Tis a debt that is due when a promise hath been made, and I, for my part, have given to thee all that was promised by me. I have not yet considered the matter, said Yucky. Thou hast promised Etain's very self to me, said Mir. That is what has come from thee. Etain blushed for shame when she heard that word. Blush not, said Mir to Etain, for in no wise has thy wedding feast been disgraced. I have been seeking thee for a year with the fairest jewels and treasures that can be found in Ireland, and I have not taken thee until the time came when Yuki might permit it. Tis not through any will of thine that I have won thee. I myself told thee, said Etain, that until Yuki should resign me to thee, I would grant thee nothing. Take me then for my part, if Yuki is willing to resign me to thee. But I will not resign thee, said Yuki. Nevertheless, he shall take thee in his arms upon the floor of this house, as thou art. It shall be done, said Mir. He took his weapons in his left hand and the woman beneath his right shoulder and he carried her off through the smoke hole of the house. And the hosts rose up around the king for they felt that they had been disgraced and they saw two swans circling round Tara and the way that they took was the way to the elf mound of Femen or Shi'ar Femen. The, and Yuki with an army of the men of Ireland went to the elf mound of Femen which men called the Mound of the Fair-Haired Women. And he followed the counsel of the men of Ireland, and he dug up each of the elf mounds that he might take the, his wife from thence. And Mir and his host op opposed them, and the war between them was long. Again and again the trenches made by Yuki were destroyed. For nine years, as some say, lasted the strife of the men of Ireland to enter into the fairy palace. And when at last the armies of Yuki came by digging to the borders of the fairy mound of Brele, Mir sent to the side of the palace sixty women, all in the shape of Etain, and so like to her that none could tell which was the queen, and Yuki himself was deceived, and he chose instead of instead of Etain, her daughter Mes Bochala, or as some say Essa. But when he found that he had been deceived, he returned again to sack Brile, and this time Etain made herself known to Yuki by proofs that he could not mistake, and he bore her away in triumph to Tara, and there she abode with the king. Another version of this story adds, it was on this account that the fairy folk of Magbreg and Mir of Brile broke the taboos of Conora and ended his life that brought about the laying waste of Magbreg because of the destruction of Brele and Yuki Arams taking away Etain by force. So there you go. And Alex says, sorry, my apologies. Alex says, two swans, Angus Ogan, care exactly. Uh, Mir and Etain uh, transform into two swans to escape through the smoke hole in the roof uh, at Tara. Uh, and that's how they escape. Uh, the same similar sort of shape change changing transformation thus ends Tuchmark Etain and that is from Ancient Irish Tales uh, by Cross and Slover and I shall put its dust jacket back on and Margaret says she got back to Tara yay yeah well I hope that uh, she wasn't reduced to the menial task of pouring wine for the men at Tara one could talk about sexism in Irish mythology as an episode, perhaps. Um, Auto Gypsy, sorry, Astro Gypsy. I visited Sedona, Arizona, looking for them. I didn't find any working portals, but places of power are a long passion of mine, certainly. I'll have to Google. Yeah, places of power indeed. The Hill of Tara is, of course, one of those very great places of power. Okay. Aaron is talking about my copious free time. Well, I, 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 yes, yes. When I'm not doing live Irish myths uh, and working, 
shiny things Aragad or yes silver and gold uh, I'd be very happy to take questions or comments or just to have a little bit of a chat with you we've just gone over the hour and it's been a lovely time as usual uh, lovely interaction going on between some of you there um, uh, just trying to think about uh, what's coming in terms of uh, episodes we're going to uh, sooner rather than later um, I'm going to return to the, uh, the Finn and the Fianna, uh lest we get too disconnected from that uh, but there's loads and loads to choose from I have a very very long list here and it's getting longer each day oh yes yeah, Skota was one of the early ones suggested by Maureen O'Leary uh, which we haven't got round to yet so perhaps we'll do Skota pardon me in the next uh, few days Queen Maeve is another of the early suggestions that we haven't done. So we'll have to do that. Deirdre and the Sons of Ishnok is a long story. That may have to be split into two or three episodes. Uh, also, uh, Togal Brunya da, da Derga, the destruction of Da Derga's hostel, uh, is also a lengthy one that will require two or three episodes. But I know you'll all be along uh, gladly for that. Um... The burning of Din Rig was another suggestion made by Andrew Byrne and the intoxication of the Ulstermen, although that's part of Toyn Bo Coolnia. Uh, and I wonder if we get stuck into Toyn Bo Coolnia, if we shouldn't just sort of maybe start it, do two or three episodes of it, take a break with something else and go back to it and do another two or three episodes. I'll have to think about that. Laura Gawala uh, and the arrival of the two of the Dan in, in particular and the Milesians are two episodes that we have to do. Uh, uh, Turning into animals is a suggestion. Sacred trees. The mythology of Douth and Nouth and Newgrange. Three, probably three separate episodes. At least two anyway. We could do Nouth and Douth perhaps uh, in one. Uh, Eru. And we could do Eru in conjunction with uh, Bamba and Fola. Which will cross over into the Laura Gawala episode. But I think we should treat Eru uh, on her own. Margaret says I'm working in Mullingar at the moment the swans on the canal there are amazing they, they fly up the canal every day I love them I imagine at this stage that the whooper swans which come to Brunabonia have returned uh, to Iceland uh, Alex says sorry I'm trying to see more uh, and it keeps I can't see more for, for some reason I can't see more okay I'll, I'll have a look at it on the I seen one source saying Etain was daughter of Dian Kecht, as well as a sun deity too. What would your views of this be? As well as the story of Tirnanog, the goddess that loved Oshin in the other world. Some versions say was Etain. Uh, 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 oh, uh, you mean Neof? Um, oh yeah, sure. I don't have to. I have it here. Let me just return to Etain uh, uh, in the Oxford in MacKillop to see just whether there are any. Uh, Dean kicked, yes. Sometimes. Doesn't seem to mention the connection with Dean kicked there, Alex. That doesn't mean it's not. Yucky, wife of Yucky Aram, lover of Mir. His name is widely cited in their She may have originally been a sun goddess. Suggested links with Epona of the continental Celts. She may have originally been a sun goddess, as T.F. O'Rahilly asserted. Etain's divinity persists in Tukmark Etain, even though her story has her reborn. Yes, we were talking about that, weren't we? About the rebirths. Uh, uh, um, um, theme the fact that she um, was swallowed in a cup wasn't that at the end of the first version actually I didn't read that last night because I thought it would be repetition but perhaps it's worth just reading tonight uh, just as a means of finishing last night's tale thereafter Etain was brought up by Etar at Inber Kirchmana and 50 chieftains' daughters were reared along with her, and they were fed and clothed for the purposes for the purpose of attending Etain at all times. Uh, 
One day, when all the girls were bathing at the mouth of the river, they saw a rider coming towards them from the plain. His horse was broad and brown, prancing, with curly mane and curly tail. He wore a green cloak of the she, and a tunic with red embroidery, and the cloak was fastened with a gold brooch that reached to either shoulder. A silver shield with a rim of gold was slung over his shoulder, and it had a silver strap with a gold buckle. In his hand, he carried a five-pronged spear, we heard that tonight, with a band of gold running from butt to socket etc 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 the young warrior rode away then and they knew neither whence he had come nor where he had gone the mock og went to speak with mir but he did not find fuamnok there mir said to him fuamnok has lied to us and if she hears that etain is in eru she will she will go to do her harm. Etain has been at my house at the in the brew in the brew for a while now, said the Makog, in the form in which she was blown away from you. And it may be that Fuamnok has gone there. Oh yeah, Makog returned to the house with the crystal bower and uh, Etain was not in it. He followed Fuamnok's trail until he overtook her at Enoch Bovni, at the house of the druid Bressel Etherlaw. And there he attacked her and struck off her head and took it back with him to Bruna Bonia. Wow. So Fuamnok ended up losing her head at the end of episode one. Yohu Aram became king of Eru and the five provinces of the country submitted to him. And the king of each province, Krohor son of Nes, Mesgegra, Mes Tirnak, Tate Bandok, Kuri and Ailil son of Mata Murishk. Eku's forts were Dun Freymand in Mija and Dun, Dun Freymand in Tethbe. And of all the forts in Eru, Dun Freymand in Tethbe was the one he loved most. The year after he became king, Yohu ordered the men, that's Yoki, it's a slightly different spelling, all the men of Eru to hold the fesh of Tower. Yeah, and so then we were back into it. But what was the bit? Wasn't there a part where, uh, in one version, she was swallowed? Uh, as a as as a worm or a fly and reborn, uh, which reminds me of uh, Satanta's rebirth. That when uh, Dectina has been told by Lou that he he appeared to her in a dream at Brunabonia and said she was going to have a child. That um, uh, you know, she she drank a worm in a cup that ended up, you know, uh, putting the baby into her belly or something like that. Erica Rivertree, the settling of the manor of Tara. Brilliant. Yes. Containing reference to one of my favourite characters of Irish mythology, Fintan MacBocra. Settling of the Manor of Tara is down now as an episode suggestion. Anyway, sorry, I, I, I wormholed there again, didn't I? I went way down a rabbit hole too far. How interesting, as Venus was at the centre of the Pleiades a few days ago. Actually, Tracy, I think uh, Venus is going to be at the centre of the Pleiades on the 4th of April, which is two days from now. I'm just going to check that on Stellarium while I'm talking to you. It's very close anyway. Uh, Alex says, oh, yes, you do have to be careful where you see sources. Thank you for checking, checking though. Yeah, you see stuff online uh, pertaining to Irish and Celtic mythology. And if it doesn't have references and footnotes that you can follow, you need to go and find another source. You need to be able to find what was the source, uh, who's translating, where is it coming from? Uh, is the source a genuine one or is it somebody kind of making it up as they go along? Venus is at its maximum elongation from the sun. This happens once in eight years and it becomes that really brilliant evening time object. Right now, uh, Venus is very close to the Pleiades, just immediately underneath. Now, if I just forward by one day. Yes, Venus is actually in the Pleiades tomorrow. Tomorrow night, Venus is in the Pleiades. Uh, actually, by the 4th, it's moving to slightly above. Tonight, it's beneath. Tomorrow, it's in. And so the 3rd of April, folks, maybe tomorrow evening, uh, remind us all. Uh, when Live Irish Mits is ending, uh, that we should all go outside and look up at the sky. Just making sure I haven't missed any. Green cloak of the she. Interesting, a good way to identify them. But cloaks are interesting in general. You have the Feth Fiada, 
uh, of Mananon, the Cloak of Invisibility, which keeps the Dedanans invisible from mortal eyes. And you also have Bridget's Cloak, which stretched out uh, to form or to cover uh, when she wanted land for her to graze her cattle on from the King of Leinster. And he said to her, you can have as much as your cloak covers. And when she put the cloak on the ground, it extended and covered the whole uh, plain of uh, the Curra. Aaron says, wouldn't it be fascinating to rewrite these tales with the roles of the sexes reversed? My husband has directed many of Shakespeare's plays done this way. Yeah, it would be interesting, actually. What would also be interested is to see some more up to date translations of the old Irish work works. And to see if perhaps some of the sexism that's there and some of the antiquated language would disappear in a new translation, you know. There would be a lot of eye rolling, I would imagine, says Margaret, I think so. On Cree Arch says, bring back the fifth province. Uh, just between us, the, the fifth province never went away. Love it when you go down the rabbit hole, says Wendy. <laughs> yeah, and there's so much stuff there behind. It's so easy to get distracted. Guion Bach was pecked up as a grain by Keridwen and she became pregnant by it and was then reborn by her and became Talisin. Very interesting. There you go. There's another sim sim similarity in Celtic mythology. Kerem says misleading info is really bad and there's lots of it on the net and just like everything that you see in terms of fake news and uh, uh, stuff on the internet and conspiracy nonsense people share it without questioning the veracity of it unfortunately and that's how it gets propagated you have to go back to the sources and the sources unfortunately for for fortunately for people like me but unfortunately for uh, the people who don't do the research the sources are medieval <laughs> uh, thanks to the scribes who uh, who wrote all this stuff down um yeah we don't have to uh, worry about uh, the veracity of the sources. Get a photo, Anthony. Get a photo of what? Yeah, you see, I'm reading these some of these comments after the fact and I'm not sure what they refer to. I'm very sorry, Maeve. I don't know what you're talking about. Get a photo of Margaret Ring. Stonehenge Dronehenge is taking amazing photos of it, Anthony. Margaret, he fills the roles in the plays according to who the kids are in his classes most are young women brilliant Cork Naman Abu wonder how much Tolkien inspired from Irish mythology while writing The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings I remember reading a, a Sunday newspaper article about that a few years ago Karen, that claimed quite a lot more than Tolkien ever admitted to <laughs> interestingly do you have anything from Mananon MacLear on your list um I was just about to say we did man and on, didn't we? And now I can't remember. We did man and on. Hang on, can I just scroll down through? Yes, we did. Uh, episode number 10, Molly. So if you go to... All the episodes are in one place on the Mythical Ireland blog, which I'll just paste in there as a comment uh, here on Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, and if you go to... Uh, or on the YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Mythical Ireland, it's episode number 10, man and on, MacLear. Uh, God of the Sea. Like the adventure of Cormac MacArt. Cormac MacArt is on the list uh, for an episode. Uh, so we will be doing uh, Cormac. Oh, a photo of Venus in the Pleiades. Of course, Maeve. I'm sorry. Yes. Now I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Maybe tomorrow, uh, just as we're wrapping up tomorrow, uh, maybe if somebody prompted us to, uh, well, those of us who are in Ireland, because I know if you're in the States, you'll be waiting a number of hours before nightfall. Uh, but those of us who are in Europe could go out perhaps and take a photo and have a look at Venus in the Pleiades. Karim says, that is why I stick with old books, even when it comes to self-development. Yeah, I think that, uh, um, well, I think so long as your sources are good, scholarly sources, and that they're translating. Don't forget, Morgan taught us, I thought, a very valuable lesson uh, two nights ago when we dealt with... Um, Uh, the Morrigan, um, in that uh, the two uh, translations of Caught My Chura, which are by Elizabeth Gray and uh, Whitley Stokes, there were sections that they had uh, basically declined to translate uh, because the language was obscure. And Morgan made a brave attempt. And whether the scholars agree with Morgan and whether other old Irish experts uh, would uh, agree or not is, is not 
I, I think, the immediately relevant point. The point is that she tried to make a translation uh, that she's been doing this for a long time uh, and uh, it paints uh, Morrigan's role as being more important in the story than we would have gleaned from the older translations and perhaps again returning to this, the theme of sexism perhaps 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 that might have been an issue but not necessarily I'm not trying to uh, castigate uh, Stokes or Gray uh, who were brilliant scholars in their own time. Balor's Hill at four. Hello Anthony how are you says Adele Perth Game of Thrones too. Hi Adele how are you and uh, it's great to see some of our Australian viewers in. Uh, I imagine it's morning time there uh, and so I trust you're keeping well and that you're Physically isolated, physically distanced, but not socially isolated and keeping in touch with everybody. Yeah, we've done man and on more, more, more. <laughs> What's the significance of Venus in pleasure? I presume that's autocorrect from Pleiades, if you have time. Um, not sure that there's an immediate significance uh, in terms of Irish mythology. Yeah, the Pleiades. <laughs> yeah, autocorrect. It's, it can be a pest. Um, but the Pleiades... Uh, uh, in 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 old in the in in Irish the Pleiades uh, one of the names for the Pleiades was the wren which I think is fascinating you know that little bird uh, uh, for which the the hunting of the wren was done on Saint Stephen's Day traditionally a small bird with a tiny tail the ran the ran the king of the birds uh, in relation to doubt uh, the Pleiades are interesting let me just paste it in as a link so that you can go down the rabbit hole yourself, uh, Graham, and those of you who are interested. Um, there's an interesting connection there, the Stone of the Seven Suns uh, and a possible heliacal rising of the Pleiades in the Neolithic at the time of the equinox. Uh, Venus is interesting because it has uh, an eight year cycle and in those eight years it goes through five, yeah, on Throlin, exactly, on Creoch. Uh, it goes through five synodic periods where it appears in each of those five periods it appears as a morning star and an evening star and in its current iteration as the evening star it is at its maximum elongation eastern elongation from the sun in other words it's maximum separation what that means in plain english is that there is no time other than now and in another eight years and another eight years when you will see venus quite so far from the sun in other words you'll see it for much longer in the evening sky because in other iterations it's closer to the sun and only appears briefly as the twilight wanes to black and then it dips below the horizon this is its maximum elongation. This is the peak Western appearance of, of Venus in the eight year cycle. Anyway, folks, it's been a lovely night. Thank you all for dropping in to say hello. It's heartwarming that uh, you 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 are uh, can many of the regulars are in and we're all the time seeing new viewers from different parts of the world. Lovely to have you along. Look, we're trying to keep our spirits up. And I think doing a good job of it, uh, distracting ourselves nicely by delving into old Irish stories. There's lots, 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 lots more to come. Uh, so long as we are able, we will. In the meantime, make sure that you keep washing your hands very well for 20 seconds or more, half, half a minute. Keep your distance from people, two metres or six feet if you're in old money. If you're over 70 and you're living in Ireland, you have to cocoon, which means that you should really be staying indoors and uh, minimising contact with humans. Uh, I know that's difficult. Hopefully you have a grip, a grip of the technology and you're able to make connections like this. And I see other people doing this, by the way. I'm not the only one. Um, so there's lots of stuff on there that you can do uh, to interact with people and it's almost as good as being in the room with them uh, except for we can't have a handshake and a hug uh, and all the rest so good night to you all and we'll see you tomorrow for episode 23 I'll announce the subject matter of tomorrow's episode sometime around the middle of the day today I announced the, today's episode early before 11am this morning um, just keep an eye out on the Mythical Ireland Facebook page and on the Mythical Ireland community on Facebook and on the Twitter uh, feed uh, for the subject. In the meantime, thank you for all the lovely interaction, all the questions and the comments. I'm sorry for those who asked questions. 
But if you want, or tomorrow, <laughs> if you want, we can get back to them. So just remind me of them may, maybe later. In the meantime, uh, uh, no matter where you are, er fod on dawn, and uh, slánche, and good health, and be in good stead until we see you again, hopefully tomorrow. This is Live Irish Myths, episode number 22. Good night. <laughs>